What are you? Are you an emergent property or function of brain chemistry? Are you just a complicated arrangement of particles? Is everything you are just the result of the activity of neurons? The popular narrative is that consciousness is somehow created by the brain and everything we think, dream, or feel is just a result of brain chemistry. However, very little data supports this notion and evidence is piling up that consciousness is not the result of brain activity, but something more. There is no greater mystery than the hard problem of consciousness. How do mental experiences and consciousness itself emerge from non-living matter? How is it that an organ made of mitochondria-filled cells, like your liver or kidney, is able to generate consciousness, thoughts, and a sense of the mind? Despite the narrative in today's society that the brain creates consciousness, we simply have no way to explain how this happens. In 2005, the 125th anniversary issue of Science Journal ranked this as one of the biggest questions left unsolved. Neuroscientist John Eccles writes, Nowhere in the laws of physics or in the laws of the derivative sciences, chemistry and biology, is there any reference to consciousness or mind? Colin McGuinn says, The problem with materialism is that it tries to construct the mind out of properties that refuse to add up to mentality. Ye Guan Kim says, How could a series of physical events, little particles jostling against one another, electric current rushing to and fro and so on, blossom all of a sudden into a conscious experience? Why should any experience emerge from molecular biological processes? The fact remains, there is no explanation of how the mind or consciousness could arise from physical properties, and there is a large amount of data that suggests consciousness is not a creation of brain processes. It was decades ago that neuroscientist Wilder Penfield began to discover hints of this. Applying an electrode to parts of the brain, he could force patients to do several things. He could cause arms to move involuntarily, vocalize involuntarily, as well as recall memories. But there was an important exception in his studies, he could not force patients to act involuntarily. In other words, he could not stimulate the will. There is no place in the cerebral cortex where electrical stimulation will cause a patient to believe or to decide. I am forced to conclude that there is no valid evidence that either epileptic discharge or electrical stimulation can activate the mind. Penfield argued there was a causal force missing within the brain that could account for the actions and intentions of the mind. He argued the mind was not in the brain chemistry and could not be explained by it. None of the actions that we attribute to the mind has been initiated by electrode stimulation or epileptic discharge. If there were a mechanism in the brain that could do what the mind does, one might expect that the mechanism would betray its presence in a convincing manner by some better evidence of epileptic or electrode activation. Penfield spent much of his career searching for the physical basis of consciousness within the brain. But such a connection was never found, and Penfield had to admit this endeavor had failed. Although to this day, various theories exist based on correlations found in the brain, no proof for a physical basis of consciousness has been shown to exist. The main problem is correlations between the brain and the conscious mind are expected to exist even if consciousness doesn't reduce to brain activity or functions. On substance dualism or idealism, we would expect correlations in the brain with consciousness. So correlations alone do not show the brain creates consciousness. That is confusing correlation with causation. Correlations are what needs to be explained. They alone are not evidence the mind is emergent. In fact, researchers have pointed out even if the brain creates consciousness, our current methods and technology are incapable of discovering it. So when some physicalists assert the discovery of correlations in the brain is evidence the brain creates consciousness, they are not being accurate with regards to the implications and limitations of these discoveries. 
Another problem that has plagued neuroscience is how unified perceptions emerge. For example, different parts of the brain store information about the color of an object, and different parts store information about the shape of an object. Yet there is no place where the brain combines this information into a unified perception. This is called the visual binding problem. Where do brains combine information to form one unified perception, like we subjectively experience in reality? In 2013, a paper was published in the Journal of Cognitive Neurodynamics titled The Neurobinding Problems, and demonstrated from various studies that the visual system of the brain has been completely mapped and there was no place that could be responsible for unifying perceptions. This is not to say it hasn't been found yet. Instead, the paper noted, after the entire visual system was mapped, no area could potentially cause subjective experiences and unify perceptions. To quote from the paper directly, there is now overwhelming biological and behavioral evidence that the brain contains no stable, high-resolution, full-field representation of a visual scene, even though that is what we subjectively experience. The structure of the primate visual system has been mapped in detail, and there is no area that could encode this detailed information. The subjective experience is thus inconsistent with the neural circuitry. With the entire visual system mapped, we can see it is unlikely the brain could give rise to a unified subjective experience, and therefore cannot explain how our perceptions emerge. Other hypotheses abound, like the possibility of binding neurons, but such a model has never been shown to have any empirical evidence, let alone unify perceptions. Thus a core issue of mind, our subjective experiences cannot be explained by looking at the brain alone. The popular misconception that evidence shows consciousness or the mind arises from the brain is not actually true. There are several holes that need to be filled if this hypothesis is going to have any weight. Even Michael Shermer has to admit that many sciences are non-falsifiable and the neuroscience surrounding consciousness is classified as such. However, arguing from the incompleteness of physicalist theories is not enough. Luckily, we do have evidence that suggests consciousness may not even be contained to the brain, let alone reduced to brain chemistry. First, numerous studies have shown that mental force or focusing of the self has real discernible effects on brain chemistry. In other words, we do have evidence the mind can actively change the brain chemistry instead of just being a creation or effect of the brain. Let's go over the fact that the more we study neuroscience, the more we realize the brain is referred to as plastic, meaning throughout our lifetime, the brain will change and adapt as a result of experience. New pathways are constantly forming and being remade in order to deal with environmental changes. For example, in 2006, two neuroscientists published a study which argued the subjective experience of interacting with other people's faces modifies the face perception neurons in the receiver's brain. The subjective experience we have can cause real physical changes in the brain. So our experiences are shaping our brain chemistry. Other studies from various researchers, ranging from experiments on animals to working with stroke victims and patients suffering from dyslexia, suggest the brain is plastic and can be remapped and changed. In a 2001 study, Stroke victims, some who had been living for over 17 years with disabilities, underwent constraint-induced movement therapy, and it created cortical remapping in the brain. So what we do or experience can change the brain chemistry. However, this can be seen to go one step further in how individuals can act to directly influence and change the chemical makeup of the brain in certain ways. This has been seen in the work of neuroscientist Jeffrey Schwartz, who published studies working with OCD patients and demonstrated how mental effort can rewire brain chemistry. From brain scans, Schwartz found that certain parts of the brain displayed abnormal activity. However, when he would have the OCD patients engage in intense mental effort and focusing, through what he labeled as relabeling, reattributing, refocusing, and revaluing, 
He found that patients who underwent this mental focusing therapy experienced considerable relief from OCD symptoms, especially the more they engaged. But also, their brain scans indicated a realignment of the abnormal brain activity. Without any external intervention, OCD patients were directly able to reorganize and change their brain patterns by intentionally modifying their behavior and thoughts. But most importantly, the changes in the brain resulted from what Schwartz called mindful attention. Consciousness and thoughts changed and modified the brain, which would seem odd if the mind was just an emergent creation or property of the brain. It seems like it should be the result of brain chemistry, not have any causal powers over the brain. However, it seems the mind is capable of manipulating the brain and modifying the person that we want to be. Schwartz is not alone in his research. Other researchers have found direct mental effort can produce systematic changes in brain functioning, and that with training and effort, patients can alter neural circuitry. As one study put it, cognitive behavioral therapy has the potential to modify the dysfunctional neural circuitry associated with anxiety disorders. They further indicate that the changes made at the mind level within a psychotherapeutic context are able to functionally rewire the brain. Citing other research, neuroscientists Merzenich and Descharm say, this leaves us with a clear physiological fact. Moment by moment, we choose and sculpt how our ever-changing minds will work. We choose who we will be the next moment in a very real sense, and these choices are left embossed in the physical form on our material selves. Neuroscientist John Eccles argue that physicalist models like identity theory have a difficult time explaining this, as mental events cannot generate neural events. However, Eccles reports direct observation of voluntary movements by an agent that precede neural events, and there is no evidence of prior neural activity. If consciousness or the mind is purely physical, or a function or property of the physical, then it should always have a physical basis. Yet the evidence indicates that doesn't seem to be the case. Thus he argues, as well as citing additional research, that we have evidence of top-down causation, and these later studies only support this inference. An objection that is argued is that it is possible the same thing could be demonstrated with external passive stimulation instead of internal mental focusing, that you can cause the same changes in brain patterns just through prompts or forcing a subject to engage in a certain activity. However, Schwartz anticipates this and cites a study from 1993, where neuroscientist Merzenich demonstrated that passive stimulation alone simply cannot mimic the same results as internal mental focusing. Jeffrey Schwartz says, when stimuli identical to those that induce plastic changes in an attending brain are instead delivered to a non-attending brain. There is no induction of cortical plasticity. Attention, in other words, must be paid. Thus the self or the mind has real power that cannot simply be mimicked with non-sentient stimulation or external causes. A similar idea can be seen in this study where subjects were shown erotic films. Some were told to mentally focus to prevent sexual arousal, and through mental efforts, areas of the brain that focus on sexual attraction did not light up nearly as much as those that just passively watched. And so the active group was able to actively change the dynamics of their own brain activity instead of just being a slave to it. Thus, the paper concludes, ontologically, the present findings suggest that humans have the capacity to influence the electrochemical dynamics of their brains by voluntarily changing the nature of the mind processes unfolding in the psychological space. Thus, the self or mind seems to be a real ontological substance that can influence and change things on its own, instead of being an emergent effect or a property of the brain. Finally, going beyond this, another interesting piece of data is found in studies which have shown mental personalities can cause and create real discernible changes in the brain and body. In 2015, a study was published on a woman who suffered from dissociative identity disorder, also known as multiple personality disorder. 
Some of her altars claimed to be blind, whereas the woman herself was not legally blind. However, through diagnostic tests, researchers were able to verify visual evoked potentials were absent in the blind personality states, but were normal and stable in the seeing states. When a sighted alter returned, normal brain activity returned. So the mental personality determined the brain state and could literally remove the ability to see within the subject's brain. In another study, researchers performed fMRI brain scans on DID patients and actors attempting to simulate dissociative identity disorder. The results showed clear differences in the brain patterns of the DID patients between the different alters, but not in the brain scans of the actors, demonstrating mental personalities create real extrinsic changes in the brain. Observable changes in handedness and handwriting have been observed between different alters. Philip Coons reported one patient who had at least 10 different handwriting scripts among her 24 personalities. The appearance of allergies have shown up and disappeared between different alters of the same subject, such as food allergies as well as cat allergies. Rashes as allergic responses have been observed to appear when one alter was in control but not another. Scott Miller cited one study and performed another where an ophthalmologist was blind as to which patients were simulators and which were DID patients. He found there was clinically significant optical differences between alter personalities across the two studies on several different measures, such as visual acuity, manifest refraction, eye muscle balance, visual fields, pupil size, color vision, corneal curvature, and intraocular pressure. The study was replicated in 1991 with more subjects and confirmed the results of the previous studies that DID patients display physical and clinical differences between alters, although not all the same differences were observed. But this would be expected as different personalities would create different physiological changes that would not necessarily be identical across subjects. For years, researchers have reported numerous observable changes between different alters of DID subjects, even including skin changes. But if personalities are a creation of the physical neurons in the brain, they should be the effect of the physical makeup, not precede and modify brain activity and the physical body in various ways. However, if the mind or mental aspects of the person are not reducible to the chemistry of the brain, this data would be expected. Mind actually precedes matter and can change the material arrangements in limited ways. Thus, the data is piling up from numerous areas, indicating the mind is not an effect or function of the brain, but a real ontological substance that is not only irreducible, but a real and active force that can change and modify the brain. As neuroscientist John Eccles said, the data strongly reinforces our belief in the human soul and its miraculous origin. We are not soulless zombies or the mere effect of a physical brain. We are conscious, self-aware minds that go beyond the physical. And the scientific evidence supports this conclusion.